on behalf of the joint IEEE joint chapter circuits and systems, photonics, solid state circuits, and electronic electron, electron devices, and also on, on behalf of the Australian Centre for Space Engineering Research. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Professor Bezerra. So he's been visiting us from, from Brazil. Uh, from the University of Santa Catarina. So, so he's going to be talking and uh, giving us a talk about the, the space activity or doing projects with the space agency in Brazil and give us some uh, case studies that he has experience in. And I think it will be great to see what type of collaboration that we, we can have. I mean, we've been having long discussions about that. So it will be great to see if there's anything we can do collective and and take it from there. So without further ado, we are running a bit late anyway. So, Eduardo, the floor is yours. Hey. So, thank you, Ed, for organizing this, this meeting, this seminar. Um, thank you all for coming. I hope I can share some of our ex experience with you. Thank you to uh, Andrew for having me this all this time, finding a place in Hungary, so it was really nice. And uh, so, let me start here. I have some uh, thoughts here. I, I divide my presentation in two moments, okay? In the first part, I'm going to explain or to introduce a bit about the Brazilian space program. Uh, that's my view from the Brazilian space program. If, uh, if I work from another field like uh, uh, mechanical engineering, the view would be completely different. Yeah? That's my electronic or computing view of the Brazilian space program. And the second part, I'm going to show some uh, what, what I called cooperation opportunities. Basically, some, uh, some of the work we've been developing at our uh, university. Uh, okay, uh, before that, just to, to show where we are. So, this uh, Federal University of Santa Catarina is in the Santa Catarina state of Brazil, which is in the South America. Yeah. We are kind of south of uh, Brazil. Uh, 27 degrees south, I think it is just above uh, the Gold Coast. Something <laughs> around there. Yeah? Yeah, that's where we are. It's on an island. The university is in that uh, in the city of Florianópolis. Uh, Santa Catarina is not a, a big state in Brazil, it's a kind of small state. We have uh, five units of the university around the state, eight undergraduate, undergraduate courses, 35,000 students, where 1,000 students are in the electrical engineering uh, department. That's my department. That's the main campus in Florianópolis. We have some uh, engineering courses, and the ones that uh, I work uh, more are the electro, electro electronics, control and automation engineering, computer science, aerospace engineering, and uh, computer engineering. Basically, I teach in these courses here, and I have projects with people from the aerospace engineering and uh, the computer engineering. Uh, we have a kind of uh, very good uh, students because. Uh, we are the second best electrical engineering course uh, out of 235 in Brazil, according to this research last year. We had this second position. We are behind just USP, which is the, the highest university uh, ranking, in, ranking in Brazil. Uh, we are aiming with the laboratory of uh, communications and embedded systems. Uh, my field is basically digital systems and in space applications. And uh, I work with uh, my colleague who is in the field of uh, simulation and formal verification. 
working and uh, both of us we work in space applications. Now, uh, the Brazilian space program. Uh, these are the these are the main actors of the space program. The National Institute for Space Research, INP, the Brazilian Space Agency, AED, the Brazilian industry, and the academic institutions. I'm going to describe, describe uh, a bit about this, uh, these actors. Uh, just to remember these acronyms, AED and INP, because I'm going to uh, present them and use this acronym in the, the presentation. Uh, and there is a big difference in, between INPI and AEB. Uh, some highlights of the Brazilian space program. It started in 1961. It was a presidential, presidential act. <coughs> the first uh, launches they were sounding rockets in 1965. Uh, the first uh, post-graduation program in space was 1968. Uh, in 1988, uh, Brazil signed an agreement with China to build uh, satellites. It started in 1988, and the first launching was in 1999, 11 years after that, Cybers 1. It's China, Brazil, Earth observation satellite. And uh, last year we had another launch, it was Cybers 4. That's the major uh, space uh, program we, we have now, it's the Cybers mission. You, sorry, you said it was for imaging. What sort of use do you have the imaging for? Is it just on Brazil or is it worldwide? And China as well. It's a Brazilian Chinese uh, uh, program. So, is it you know, high resolution sort of imagery? Yes, high resolution image from both countries and other countries as well. But name these two countries. Uh, here I have. Uh, the investment of the uh, Brazilian space program. I highlight here the last 10 years. You can see that the investments are basically the most important invest investments are in launching centers and satellites and the infrastructure. That's where the, the country is putting the, the money, building and uh, making better la launching centers and the satellites as well. Some of the missions uh, in the last uh, years, some uh, uh, data collection satellites, communication satellites, some missions that we had some failures in the launching. Uh, this is the first uh, satellite where I had some uh, uh, Participation in the project. Yeah, that one it was a scientific satellite. <laughs> and you're, you're the reason it failed, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I worked in this satellite in 1994, 1995, four years before the launching. I was working the communications model, model of that satellite. Uh, we don't know what happened because it didn't communicate. <laughs> <laughs> No, it wasn't my fault, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a second uh, uh, mission of the same satellite. And that time we had a launching failure. And, and is Brazil doing all these launches themselves then? As in sending the rocks? No, up? no. Usually it's in another uh, country. And after that we had the Cypress. The Cypress with uh, China it was a very successful mission. Until 2013, we had this launch of failure. But in 2014, three months ago, we had the Cyber Squad launch, and uh, everything was as well. Uh, okay, that's uh, 
the laboratory, where, the laboratory where all the satellites are integrated and tested. It's in a city very near to São Paulo, something around 150 kilometers from São Paulo. Who owns that facility? Is that MP or is that AEB? It is inside MP. MP. Yeah, it, it, it belongs to MP. Yeah. It's one of the laboratories of MP. And AEB puts money there. Mm. That's, uh, it shows the next missions, lots of opportunities here. There are more cyber missions coming in the next years. But the missions that uh, I'm more interested in are these ones, Amazonia, Mapsar, Lattice. These ones, they are going to use one of the uh, uh, systems we are working. We are helping uh, in building this system, so that's our main uh, target now, these satellites. Now, the difference, uh, I'm not sure of the difference, but the functions of each of these actors, AEB, IMP, and the private sector. AEB is more on a kind of uh, uh, administrative and uh, they do the space policy. IMP, they make the satellites and the applications. Basically, that's the, uh, what they do. And the industry, they provide the parts to do it. I'm going to show to you a video uh, from INPE. Just it's a kind of difficult to to explain what INPE is with uh, some uh, pictures. So I'm going to show a video. And the highlight highlights of this video and basically are the three, three main areas of INPE: it's scientific applications and engineering. Engineering is the area where I uh, work more with him. And they are going to show in this video also some other interesting uh, things, including the integration and the test laboratory, that picture I showed to you. I think the video is the best way to, to explain what IMP is for those who never heard of. That's the main interest of the Institute. Created in 1961, the National Institute of Space Research, INPE, subordinated to the Ministry of Science and Technology, is Brazil's main point of reference and of excellence in the field of space activities and their applications. INP contributes towards the country's scientific, technological and industrial development. Monitors its agricultural and environmental resources and helps to promote sustainable development and improvements to the population's quality of life. INPE has its head office in São José dos Campos, state of São Paulo. These are some of the Institute's principal installations. The Satellite Tracking and Control Center, the Associated Laboratories, and the Laboratory for Satellite Integration and Testing, the largest of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. Located in Cachoeira Paulista, São Paulo, are the Combustion and Propulsion Laboratory and the Center for Weather Forecasting and Climatic Studies, CPTEC. INPE also has installations in the north, northeast, center west, southeast, in the south of Brazil, and at the permanent Brazilian station in the Antarctic. The Inter-American Institute for Research into Global Climate Changes 
supported by 19 countries, and the Regional Center for Education and Space Science and Technology for Latin America and the Caribbean, located in the South Regional Center. These activities focus on three principal areas, the scientific area, the applications area, and the engineering area. In the sciences of space and the atmosphere, INPI investigates physical and chemical phenomena occurring in the atmosphere and in outer space, through research and experiments in the fields of aeronomy, astrophysics, and space geophysics. Those are some of the satellites I showed you. Using stratospheric balloons and sounding rockets for studies of the upper atmosphere, telescopes in balloons for the study of cosmic radiation, such as MASCO, launched in April 2004, and runs a program for monitoring and forecasting space climate. In big basic research groups study plasma physics, new materials, nanotechnology, and scientific computing. NP engineers are also involved in space mechanics and control, aerospace electronics and ground systems. Knowledge gained in the scientific area is also disseminated through training and postgraduate courses which attract hundreds of students annually from various academic backgrounds. The NP Visitor Center welcomes around 12,000 people per year. The NP Library contains more than 60,000 titles with a modern digital system for accessing technical and scientific data. The Applications Area handles studies and observations of the Earth, such as forecasting of agricultural harvests, real-time monitoring of deforestation, and forest fires, and numerical forecasts of weather and climate. The INP projects to generate and disseminate knowledge and technology for responding to the demands and challenges provoked by global changes are linked to research in Earth system science. INP leads the Brazilian Research Network on Global Climate Changes, Edi Clima, instituted by the Ministry of Science and Technology, and participates and contributes with programs and international forums on the theme, such as the IPCC. Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Changes. Another example in the area of Earth System Sciences is the program Space and Society, created to expand the benefits and products of the space program and convey them to the citizen. INPI has supercomputers which place Brazil among the countries in the world with a high processing capacity dedicated to weather and climatic operations and research. INPI is not, not, it's not very new. <laughs> yes, it's, it's about a decade. Microsatellites such as the SCD series developed by INPI provide some of the data used in this processing, collected from more than 600 autonomous data collection platforms spread around the whole of Brazil and South America. Weather and climate forecasts and climate change tendencies are available to the communications media and to users either through the internet or by telephone. INPI's satellite Earth observation activities involve scientific and technological knowledge in the fields of remote sensing, geoprocessing, surveying of natural resources, and monitoring of the environment. For this, it develops free software for the processing of geo-reference data. The research supports programs such as the real-time detection of deforestation by analysis of satellite images developed by the Ministry of the Environment. This program permits immediate action against illegal deforestation. The Center for Assistance to Satellite Image Users responds daily to more than 400 requests from Brazilian users providing free Seabird satellite images through the internet. The engineering area develops space technology for satellite and ground systems, complex products that demand a high level of technological know-how. This area handles development of satellites for science and technology, such as the SCD satellites for environmental data collection. Amazonia 1, the first to be integrated with a multi-mission platform, and the Seabirds for observing the Earth's resources, <coughs> developed in cooperation with China. The 
China Brazil Earth Resources Satellite Program, CBERS, is one of the highlights of international cooperation in which INP is involved. The first satellite of the series, CBERS 1, was launched from China on October 14, 1999. CBERS 2 was launched on October 21, 2003. The CBERS 2B, which was launched in 2007, contains an experimental high resolution camera used principally in urban planning. The CBERS program includes the launch of two more satellites until 2013 the CBERS 3 and the CBERS 4, with even more advanced technology than their predecessors. Among the major global challenges of the 21st century, INPI is well placed to be the principal national research and development center in the areas of space and the environment, offering exceptional products and services to the benefit of the whole of society. So that's just to give you an idea about INPI. Uh, now something uh, about the Brazilian aerospace industry. Uh, so that's something that the director of INP said. Space technology, technology is developed by the industry. That's uh, his view. At the moment, there are around 250 million Australian dollars in contracts to build several uh, systems, onboard computer systems, solar panels, and uh, cameras, and also the multi-mission platform. And uh, there are lots of uh, Brazilian companies uh, working in this, in this project. Uh, <coughs> these are uh, the contracts for CBERS 3 and 4, just the Brazilian part of the, the, the contracts. There are the Chinese companies as well, but this, that's just the Brazilian part. This is the multi-mission platform. The idea of this platform, it's not used in Sibers, it's going to be used in the uh, future satellites. And the idea is to reuse the same platform in several satellites. There are lots of contracts as well, lots of companies doing the different modules of the satellite, of this platform. It looks rather spacious at the moment, as in a large amount of volume isn't being occupied. Is this just an No, it's just, it's just a layout. It's not a defined. Uh, it's okay. just to, to show what each company is doing. It's not the final. Yeah, there is a lot of space. Amazonia 1 is the first satellite to use the multi-mission platform and the payload over there. Uh, MAPSA, another one. It's a completely different satellite with another function, everything is different, but, but it's going to use the same, the same plat platform, the, the same service platform. The payload will be completely different. The Brazilian Space Agency. The Brazilian Space Agency, so they don't make satellites, they don't make applications, but they give us money to do this thing. Uh, they have several programs. In our case, in the university, we get uh, funding from this uh, program here, Unispace, and uh, which, which means University in Space, and the Microgravity Program. Those are the main programs we are receiving our funding. The Unispace program, they they give money for projects uh, working with sensors, actuators, rockets, propulsion, uh, materials, everything. In our case, we have uh, uh, funding for developing a ground station, uh, the onboard computer, uh, CubeSats, we are funded by the Brazilian Space Agency as well in our CubeSat project, and also for the test and validation of our systems. The microgravity program, uh, the idea is to launch 
in Sony, Sony Rocks launch experiments. This is one of our experiments we launched some years ago. It's a thermal experiment. That's just to show uh, how it works. The launching, the microgravity uh, stage of the experiment, something around four minutes. The experiment stays in microgravity for around uh, five minutes. And then it lands on the sea. Sometimes we can't get back the payload because it gets lost in the sea. Those are the sounding rockets. We have been using this one, VSB-30, for the launches. And everything is paid by the Brazilian space agents. Uh, in 2004, we had uh, two of our experiments, similar to the ones that we launched in Sound Rockets. We had it in the uh, ISS. We had a Brazilian mission to the ISS, paid by the Brazilian space agents. They paid the, these tickets to go to the International Space Station with our experiments. It was a very nice uh, product. So now, the second part of the presentation, now I introduce to you the Brazilian Space Program. You know something about the Brazilian Space Agents, the industry, and, the, and about the MP. Now what we are doing at the university. And let's see if we can identify some cooperation opportunities. Some of these opportunities I included here after I, my uh, no, no, our meetings with Oliver as well, and with, with uh, Sri from CSE. First, the microgravity. The microgravity, we have a deadline tomorrow. I wrote something for that uh, uh, program. And there is a new one. I just received the, that email yesterday, yeah. I showed to you. Yeah. The new poll. The deadline for new proposals is 27th of April. This one's a kind of different. Uh, it's the first time we are doing this kind of uh, experiment because we are supposed to build an electronic device, a wearable device, non-invasive, to analyze uh, human ph physiology, yeah. how it reacts to the microgravity effects. It's another kind of spacecraft. Now there will be uh, somebody on board the spacecraft wearing this, uh, this device for around four to five minutes as well. Five to six minutes, and we'll come back. And another deadline, if there is uh, somebody working with uh, uh, bioengineering, could to be an uh, opportunity for cooperation. And uh, it's around, it's around 75,000 Australian, Australian dollars to build the, the experiment, the wearable device. That's what they give. Um, what sort of things are you, reactions are we expecting? Are we just talking extremely small? At least the device has to measure ECG, at least. And then you can do whatever you want. Measure, you know, not blood, you can't take because it's not invasive. Blood pressure, things like that, yeah, that's fine. So we need to use the imagination and talk to people from bioengineering to see what kind of body, body reaction we need. Somebody may be interested to in measuring in this microgravity environment. And can I ask a really silly question, please? Um, it keeps being referred to as microgravity. Is it expected, is this just a, as close approximation to zero gravity or is it intentionally being microgravity for a reason you're after? Um, as, as in, I, is it just almost no gravity you're cared about the effects of on people or is it actually not, certain not amounts? Not only people, okay, this one is on people, but the other experiments, it's not exactly on people, it's everything we can imagine. Because things like droplets, I can understand that very small yes. amounts of gravity could do interesting things to the dynamics of the stuff. Let me give you an, an example of one of these experiments with, experiment with people. Yeah? It's um, 
a kind of uh, instrument to take uh, blood samples from astronauts. That's the sort of experiment I, I saw it in one of these microgravity experiments. They took it from the ear and uh, just to avoid the blood to, to go around the spacecraft. Because the body will be floating in zero gravity. That's the sort of experiment. Well, there's a distinction between the effects of microgravity over about six weeks where you actually start losing calcium from the bones mm. and the ex sort of effects of microgravity over about Something four like or five minutes where you yeah. might see some change in blood pressure. Yes, four or five minutes uh, you need to see that change in the blood But why does it have to be non-invasive? Is there anything particular? No, it's, I think it's because it's just, it's just for five to six minutes so you don't have time to... Oh, okay. But the other point is that if you've got something invasive and you've got four or five gravities in the pullout, yeah. you are going to be yeah. comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. So there is this distinction. I'm just curious about this because I presume we've had people on space stations for such long periods of time. Why is the research going to be done on a craft such they, as this? They do it in the International Space Station, they do it all the time. But then what is the advantage of then taking the shuttle up, doing it on that as well, and then taking it down? How well, would that be a different environment or different tests? Is, uh, this person here, he won a contest to fly in this aircraft. So he needs to do something. He needs uh, okay. for the Brazilian space agency. So he needs to fight questions. him. They're giving us money. Yes. <laughs> it, well, it's, it's still great. I was, I was just curious if there was something interesting extra happening there. That's all. Yeah. He could have brought with him some other kind of experiment, but somebody said, okay, let's measure something in the body. And arguably, it could also be stress testing, as you say, wearing it during the whole procedure, if it's completely non invasive testing out during the whole cycle of launch and re-entry. Yeah, but it's a kind of different kind of love. It's 2.9. Okay, that's the microgravity. Now, on board computer, another kind of opportunity. That's the onboard computer of the satellite. We worked in this communications model of the satellite. Now we are working with I think it's a touch screen. Ah, it touched it. Okay. That's the best. Now we start working in the onboard computer as well. Oh. <laughs> uh, okay. That's our board that we designed, the communications module. Here there is the processing unit, and that's the whole onboard computer. The prototype in this one is the engineering model. It is uh, under de development at uh, IMP. Uh, okay. What do so, you do about um, heat dissipation in that? It looks to be closely packed and I couldn't see anything for pushing uh, air or whatever through it to cool it. Engineering, engineering model? Yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's an engineering model, but getting anything that does a lot of computing in a hurry, it gets warm, and you've got to take the power out. Um, um, as in thermally, are, are they yeah, going to be... Exactly thermally. Yeah. As, is it going to be issues? Is there, are the processes uh, consuming enough power for it to be no, something to worry about? It's a very low um, clock processing. If you see this one, I think it's something like uh, less than 100 megahertz. Here we have FPGAs and FPGAs as well. It's low, uh, low speed and frequency. There's so also, sorry. Yeah, no, there is no problem with heating here. There's also the opposite problem in that I know a lot of electronics don't like behaving in particularly cold temperatures as well. Presumably it's going to be constantly running, however, and keeping itself warm. But has there been any consideration of is it actually going to stay Actually, warm enough? Uh, those missions, the sounding rocket missions we did, they are all thermal missions. We had uh, uh, heat pipes to uh, spread the, the heat around all the, the, the electronics. So we are, now we are transferring the technology to, to this board. Uh, 
Okay. That's just uh, the first opportunity, opportunity I saw here. Uh, I'm sure you heard of ITA. Yeah. Everybody knows ITA. There are the restrictions to import things from uh, the American uh, components. So we can buy some, there are some kind of components that we can't buy from the US. That's the ITA. And uh, we, using that uh, onboard computer, the ERC32, it's a Spark 32 bits, we use that one. At the moment, we have something like 10 units of that microprocessor in Brazil. And we can't buy more processors. So we are planning to replace that uh, uh, microprocessor by an FPGA with a software, software processor. Yeah. Um, is That's that the one of the opportunities. Is there any particular reason you want to stay with that exact architecture? And want, is it because you're keeping the same module? Yeah, there's a lot of software here. You don't want to discard? Yeah, okay. it's a lot of work and everything is tested and validated. Take years to, to rebuild everything. Um, I'm sorry, I am not the knowledgeable the here. Neon is uh, compatible with this Spark the ITAR restriction, is that something America's done against exports or is it something Brazil exports. imports? No, there is nothing to do with Brazil. I think even Australia has problems to buy things from America. I'm not sure. Probably. I know they have some restrictions. Well, I can say for, for certain that when mm -hmm. I wanted to use a metric coupled logic random access memory in 1995 in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. which I'd been using quite successfully in England in 1989, I couldn't buy it. I knew who sold it, I knew who, I sent, I asked them for quotes, and I never got a slightest response. They got nervous about shipping anything outside America that could go to Iran and turn into effective uh, uh, high-speed radar. Because I know America does have a lot of stuff about use of their products for weaponry, but I didn't know how else it extended. Oh, it's... It got ridiculous quite early on. <laughs> Cambridge Instruments couldn't sell its, some of its electron microscopes to Russia because they used the 6502 processor in the keyboard. Oh, and that what? was a forbidden yeah, for military what? export. <laughs> Wait, just a quick... Oh, okay, uh, yeah, old story. Um, with the uh, FPGA replacement, are you guys looking to emulate the Spark core or completely redesign it to be more efficient? No, I mean to use the... This Leon, it's oh, already okay, yeah. uh, done. It's it's oh. yeah, it's a soft oh. processor. It's it, it works. It, it it is used by the European Space Agency. They made it. Oh, okay. So they're yeah. not going to redesign it. Uh, but I, I I put here there is no major challenge in this uh, opportunity, unless we are going to use SRAM based FPGAs, because so then we have the radiation problem. But if you use the anti-fuse FPGAs, that you have to use now, so there is no major challenge. You can just port in the real-time software. Um, can I ask another silly question? Anti-fuse memory, I'm presuming that's specifically designed to be space-hardened then, or radiation-hardened? I'm not sure if it's specifically designed to be radiation-hardened, but uh, it's, it's a fuse. You, you burn it. Also, or pre-written. So what, what do you, you'd have to have some sort of dynamic memory still, if... Yeah, yeah but then we, it's fine, because we, we, it's just data that we can uh, rewrite, rewrite it. But the core of the system is safe. So ah, so you're just talking about the permanent memory then, in this case? Yes. Okay. Well, just as much permanent memory is actually the way the FPGA is wired up. Yes, yeah, the configuration... Um, the is is the they don't have onboard memory, you have to... As well, off it, there. It, wow. they it's a long time since I was involved in this, but in, back in the very old days, Xilinx sold programmable logic devices where all the information about how the thing was hooked up was contained in a uh, programmable RAM that you read whenever you powered up the thing. Mm. And anybody sensible had fuses inside the thing that you blew up and they stayed that way. And then there was a more advanced model which you could reprogram at any of intervals, which was handy. Another opportunity, uh, is the same uh, situation, the same deal, but now a multi-core solution. 
it's something very uh, advanced for space applications. Right? Usually, the space problem is very conservative. So if we have a much more, so we have some challenges here: shadowing policies, operating system integration, real-time challenges. It will get hard to <laughs> to have a reliable system. Synchronizing. What would be the advantages of it? Because presumably this doesn't do a lot of the stuff like the imaging things. This is just the control system here. Why would you yes. even want a multi-core? There are lots of tasks running here. There are lots of instruments in the satellite. You, you have to position some uh, uh, sensors. You have to do lots of things. And that's the, the computer that does all this stuff. So it is a there very essential design. Of, uh, concurrent tasks. Concur yeah, uh, using this uh, CPU. If you have several parts, so we split the tasks and uh, it will be faster and more reliable and you can do, you can do more things. So you actually have hit a limit where you're having to really worry about your processing speed and what you can be doing at any one time on there. And you really want this improvement there. Yes, yeah, that's the, one of the points. Communications, more opportunities here. That's the part we, we delivered to the space uh, to Inc. It has uh, redundancy here to FPJs. And all the communication protocol is implemented in the, those FPJs. It's hot spare. Both of them are doing the same thing. If you want, the other one does the job. The job. Uh, that's just the testing uh, equipment we designed to test our, our board. That's the board. On the right side. The first opportunity. I think this one uh, I might be uh, interested in here, university, who, which is to migrate to port this UTMC, this module, to a CubeSat. We start doing uh, this kind of uh, uh, job. There is a PhD student doing that. He's doing some modeling, functional modeling with MATLAB of, of, of our system. The system is uh, is working. We delivered it to him uh, for the for a larger satellite. But he's doing this modeling here, some analysis, a new prototyping of this module, then hardware in the loop simulation with this uh, smaller size of the of our communication, and uh, the goal is to have a kind of flight qualification of this module mm -hmm. in a very cheap one. Because if you are going to use it in a CubeSat, and if it fails, it's not a big deal when comparing to a larger satellite. So, excuse me. What, when you say you're testing all this, are you testing in environmental, environmental conditions as well? So in vacuum and what? Um, yes, everything. In, uh, at uh, INPI, in, do, in, those, uh, in that laboratory I showed before, in Sao Paulo, they have all the chambers, everything, so we are going to test everything there. So that's your and last thermal vibration, everything. Yeah, but what I'm saying here is real flight qualification, like CubeSat, because with uh, 100k, uh, 100,000k dollars, we can uh, send it to space, and it's a lot cheaper than to to use in, in, a, in a very expensive expensive satellite and if it doesn't work in the expensive satellite it will be a big problem. And but everything will be certified anyway. And the board and the chips you use are the same that you would use for ground application or use mm, yeah, that's another point. We are not going to use the same one because it's a critical module of the of the satellite. But the idea in the future, it would be like that. I don't think it's possible because yeah. of the radiation. So everything you use, all the electrical components you use in space, will be specific for space application? Yes. Yeah. But there are some uh, works we are doing to use what we call the cuts, commercial of the shelf components as well. Mm -hmm. That's where we need to do uh, that. Another opportunity in the communications uh, is the software defined radio. Uh, there is a ground station under construction uh, considering some uh, protocols we use in the AX25, use the CubeSat, 
And this CSTS is the one that we use in that board we delivered to you. That's another, another opportunity for uh, cooperation. The power system of the satellite. Uh, also for a CubeSat, we, ha we are working on a kind of tool to automate, automatically generate the energy management system for the satellite. According to uh, some uh, mission uh, requirements, mission features, we, we feed our tool with this uh, 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 requirement and the tool uh, generates the, this circuit here to do the uh, management of the energy. Considering the solar panels, it, it charges the battery and it feeds uh, it sends this, uh, energy to, this, to the onboard uh, modules. Quality assurance. <laughs> we have here uh, again the ITAR regulations problem. We can't buy some components, so we need to qualify them, uh, qualify some quartz components to use in space. We have some uh, platforms we designed to use in uh, radiation chambers, and we are studying the combined, combined effects of radiation and uh, EMI to see uh, what happened in the, in the circuit, not only with the component, but also with the application that is inside the, in this case, FPGAs. That's another very interesting uh, opportunity. This one is what we have been doing a lot. It's, it, this one is a lot of documentation. Basically, <coughs> we are working in uh, uh, verification plans for VHDO, it's a hard description language, huh? based applications. We work a lot with the DO254 and also with the European Space Agency uh, standards to generate this uh, verification plans, just to be sure that the, our hardware implementation is, is fine. And this is something that we've been talking as well, about the, uh, partial reconfiguration. We have a, a situation where the tools, they, they don't work very well with the same bitstream uh, moved around different partitions. So we are working in a tool to do this in case of uh, a problem not in this uh, part of the, uh, the bitstream, the configuration of the FPGA, we can change to another one that is not in use, anything like that. Formal verification, uh, the properties used to do the formal verification of a system, usually they are generated, they are uh, created by hand, and we are uh, working in a tool to automatically uh, generate these properties from, from requirements, from the uh, uh, documentation we have, it will generate the properties, and we can have a kind of auto automatic formal verification. That's another opportunity. And finally, the CubeSat missions, our ongoing projects. We have two, actually three CubeSat missions. This one, Rory Passat, is uh, our mission. This one, Serpens, it's a consortium with several universities. And Serpens, there are two missions, Serpens 1 and Serpens 2. Let me show you something about these missions. They are funded by the Brazilian Space Agency under the Youth Space Program and also by CMPQ, which is the same uh, council, council that sends the students abroad in the Science Without Borders program. The Floripa SAT is uh, a 1U CubeSat. There are some uh, requirements here, temperature. Let me see. We started this project in 2012. They are just undergrad students working uh, 
in this project. Now we have some uh, postgrad as well, but in the beginning are just undergrad. We define it according to the ECSS MST 10C from the European uh, Community. We define uh, this phase for the project. In the beginning, we managed to deliver what we, are, we planned, and then now we are a bit uh, behind. But the idea is to launch this uh, satellite by the end of this year. That's we, it. Which launcher are you looking at to launch this? Which launch? Uh, the, uh, we are going to, to launch with uh, JAXA in Japan from the ISS. Yeah. So which orbit is going to be? It's going to be a low Earth orbit like the ISS? This CubeSat? The CubeSat? Yeah, it has to go to the ISS okay. and then they launch it. I, I have a, an image here, sorry, the, the launcher. So you're going to be hopefully doing three launches this year? Yes. Uh, no, 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 just uh, this one in the center. But we are a bit behind. That's it. That's the product speed from Project 3 of the satellite, the Lipasat, the payload, the, the service the platform, and all the, the modules. We use the MSP 430 to 49 for the onboard computer. Uh, for the communications, the 5738. These chips here for the power system. Oh, um, what chemistry of batteries are you using? It's a um, nickel cadmium. Cadmium or metal hydroxide? Mm -hmm. Okay. The payload. The payload we have now for this uh, satellite is uh, an experiment to, to measure the effects of the South American anomaly in the, in the electronics of an FPGA, s ground based FPGA. I just do some checks here and see if we can detect some single unit upsets in the, the FPGA when the uh, when the CubeSat cross the South Atlantic anomaly. Um, that diagram there was that the actual physical layout of the SRAM inside the FPGA or on the ground? It's just the FPGA, the uh, CLDs of enzymes FPGA and the interconnection, the routing, flip flops. We have tables, that's it. And the place where we can have some uh, faults. The other mission is the Serpens mission. So, Floripasat is our mission from our university. Serpens is a kind of this consortium, consortium of several universities. This one, uh, Serpens 1. Uh, what we did is uh, all the universities in Brazil that uh, all of them that they they have a kind of uh, they have an uh, aerospace engineering course, so they get together and decide to build a CubeSat, and we have the help from uh, universities from other countries, the creators of the CubeSat standard, uh, Vigo from Spain, they have a some successful missions as well. The second mission is a 3U CubeSat. We have two sectors, completely independent. If one of the sectors uh, don't work, but, uh, it doesn't work, it's not a problem because the other one, we hope, will work. So, uh, one, one of them is uh, a safe uh, um, a sector because it's done by the from by Vigo University, so they are using uh, all the boards they use in their satellite that is working. So we believe this one is going to work. The other one is the one that we built, but most of the boards we bought from somebody. The big ones we we made by ourselves. Some pictures of the board. One of the experiments is this uh, plasma thruster. We are going to test in this CubeSat. Plasma thruster? Yeah, yeah. just to uh, look, stabilize. 
I'm assuming electronic propulsion method then. Mm -hmm. Is it one of the designs where you have to eject um, ionized materials and accelerate them, or is it completely fuelless? Uh, I don't know, I'm not familiar with this. There ain't no completely fuelless thruster. Exactly. I, I mean, as in, I know that some of them um, particularly have some gases or things they store and they charge those particles ejected, but I thought some of them didn't do things like that. I'm not entirely sure. Well, 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 uh, there was the Dean drive, which was popularized in analog science back in fiction in the 1950s, and it doesn't work. <laughs> I think it was, uh, it was an ink project. It's a, it's a project from, I don't know which level, but it's like we did it. Uh, okay, that's the uh, the frame, and you, you can see it in the background. It's the laboratory, I think. So we, we can go to it to do all the integration testing using the facilities. Of course, we are not going to use the whole laboratory. We stay in a room here, making all the integration, and then we go there, to, down there, and do all the tests in some of the chambers. That's the, the boards. Uh, the universe is responsible for the sector B and the launching that you ask from the International Space Station. <laughs> it just I love how ejected. I love how overcomplicated a simple system of tossing something out of the space station is. They have to make a whole arm to do it. Well, actually, I saw a video once, I'm not sure if that video is real, but if you look for it in YouTube, an astronaut just throwing a CubeSat. I don't know if you saw it. You saw it. He, he almost uh, hit the, the one of the solar panels of the. <laughs> 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 so I think they decided to, to use this arm to eject. Uh, now the second two mission. This one is under uh, our. Uh, responsibility, our university. So those are the, the modules we are going to, to use. Most of them we are taking from Florida SAP. We are going to use the same ones. The payload is to be defined. We don't have a payload yet. The, set, the, the next seven sentence mission. All the, everything is organized. We have the, uh, the videos of each module, onboard computer, communications. And the payload is the one that we, we don't have a payload yet. And that's, I think, it would be a good opportunity for having your participation in our payload, together with the other observing investors, for if you want to have a more uh, effective participation. Now it's, we are in charge of the separate stories. Uh, basically, that's what I had for you today. And uh, if, you have, if you have any further questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the very beginning of SciShow, you talked about how funding going into launching platforms and things was increasing rapidly. Are you, is Brazil wanting to do a lot more launching itself of things? Yes, <coughs> for a huge satellites as well as millions. Because I know um, the United States, for example, has gone down dramatically and a lot of stuff, I think, to the International Space Station is going through Russia now and they're one of the major launching countries in the world, is my understanding. That's the, uh, let me translate it to English, satellite launch vehicle. <laughs> This one, we had a problem with this, uh, this, this rocket uh, 10 years ago. Uh, some of the engineers who designed the first version, they died in the accident. Oh. It was a kind of very bad thing. And now we have a new one. It's ready for flying. So just a testing. They are testing the, the engines. So and it's for launching bigger satellites. And uh, we are planning to launch to launch uh, CubeSats in those sounding rockets as well. But it's a kind of we need to have more grip to, to launch it. But this one is ready for launching. That's why they are putting a lot of money in the launching launching facilities in the country. 
there are two main launching facilities. One of them is called uh, in Portuguese is Barreira do Inferno. This one, it's Hells, something like that. And the other one is in Alcântara. There are the two main launching facilities, and they are ready for these big rockets. You, your consortium that you've got going for the Sultan missions, um, is that formalized in any way? Yes, all the universities, they signed the directors of, of the universities, they signed an, an agreement. But that's just that mission. It's not an ongoing thing where you have several things in mind and you're going to get together? Or? Well, uh, yeah, for that mission, we have to sign the agreement. Yeah. For the next ones, and the, uh, the AED signed this agreement as well, together with the uh, observing universities. Everybody signed it. So there is an NDA as well. Right. But it's, it's not like an ongoing um, CubeSat club or whatever. Mm. You all collaborate with yeah. each other on several... The thing is, we have these calls from time to time. There is a call we need to, to propose some sort of uh, uh, experiment or what we are going to do, what we are going to launch. And if we win this, this call, so we sign the agreement. Yeah. It's, it's difficult to have a long-term agreement because it's public money, so they have to give the opportunity to anyone. We can't have this kind of closed club like that. So from time to time they, they open it to, to the society. But we, we are working very well, this university. We have a, a very good... And we had a, a QSAT uh, workshop last year and uh, all people from this university were there from other universities as well. It was a very nice uh, environment to discuss CubeSat launches and opportunities. What is the role of the observing universities in the Serpent's mission? Do they, do they simply share the data or do they actually provide you with support in some way? Yes, they provide support. Uh, in this case here, they are responsible for sector B. Mm. And in sector A, for instance, our onboard computer is from Rome, from the University of uh, Rome, Sapienza, Italia, something like that. Uh, the energy, I think, is also from, I think it's from Kaupoli. Mm. So they provide some of the parts. And that's why in Serpens 2, we are going to use our onboards, the boards we, we made. And we are not sure if we are using their uh, sector B or we are going, we, or we are going to use the, this space for more experiments. That's what we are planning for Serpens too. But they, they provide everything we, we need. The technology, it's a kind of, it's a real uh, technology transfer that happened. Because they are there, the, the researchers from Vigo, they stayed at Imp for one month just helping us in the integration and everything. So it's a very good collaboration. And everything's paid by the Brazilian space agents. Just curious about your um, data reception on the ground uh, with Serpens. Is that distributed around the globe through your observing universities, or is it only going to be downlinked in Brazil? Well, uh, there are two radios. Yeah? The, the one from Vivo and our radio. Great. Uh, this one, it's already working uh, around the globe because they have their satellites and uh, they have the, this network of uh, ground stations. In our case, we have uh, 14 ground stations in, in, in universities in several states of Brazil for our reception. But for SEPNOS2, we are thinking of using our CCSTS module, which is an international standard, so we can broadcast it to the ground stations all around the world. That's the idea. Um, India has a lot of pride at the moment that they're able to send things up for a lot less money than a lot of other nations. 
and part of this serpents project is investigating how uh, COTS equipment is going to work up there as a method of potentially widening what parts you can use and making it cheaper. Um, does, uh, do you guys have a lot of pride in trying to make things cheaper? How do you compare your launch costs to the rest of the world? Well, uh, the launch costs, uh, you mean the sounding rockets or the satellites? Mainly the sending rockets point of view. The sounding rockets, from as far as I know, it's very cheap. Because there are lots of countries hiring our launches in Brazil. I think it's the main, uh, it's a kind of main business in the Brazilian space uh, program is to sell sounding rockets launches. Okay, so you launch for a lot of other countries then? Yes, yeah. There is a Ukraine company over there doing some launches. Uh, we use, we use uh, some German rockets as well. The Americans are in this buyer doing fairly doing launches as well. So there are lots of business going on there. Presumably you're taking advantage of your, geo your geography. Yes. You're sitting <laughs> right on the equator. Yeah, that's and it. What, the Ariadne rockets from France go up from... Uh, it's very close. ...from Africa are yeah. the same latitude. Yeah, it's, yeah, they're actually the same. Very, very close. Um, are you using uh, frequencies that are like standard, so like the amateur community can pick yes, them up exactly. and things like that? They're up to AX25. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, radio amateur, yeah. Are you using like uh, around 430 megahertz sort yes. of range? Okay, cool. Yeah. Then we can get it. Just get all the data from everyone around Yes. The okay, cool. Like the, the commercial, like, uh, take us as far as 433 megahertz. Is that quite the range? Uh, how, how, how is the range? Like 433 megahertz uh, frequency. Is that the. Not sure. What, what was the frequency? Is the radio amateur? Yeah, I think it's um, it's a bit higher than that. So it's it's four four fifty ish. Four thirty three is like the standard like RF like is it car key frequency? That's what it's called. Satellite, come down. Yeah, but it's like that. It's a little bit higher. Well, if four thirty three is car key, then it's going to interfere like hell with everybody who's trying to look at listen to something quite a way away. They used to use the two meter two meter um, band as well, but I think it's so full at the moment that they've said to stop using it. So now they're going to the eighty centimeter band or seventy centimeter. I'm not sure. One or two. Okay. One last question, and then <laughs> we'll, we can carry on. And we have drinks, so we can carry on after as well. Yeah. Uh, Paul. Sure. Uh, uh, professor. Uh, but, uh, Said. Uh, it's a slightly out of field question, but in something that's always puzzled me in the design of the launching systems is uh, how the engineers design the thrusters to have a uniform thrust around the. I have no uh, up idea. To the, <laughs> <laughs> the picture earlier had something interesting. All the thrusters seem to be vectored outwards so they weren't damaging the central thruster, which is very curious in one of the early pictures. Sorry, that one is. <laughs> but, but I also noticed that in your slide where you were calling for the proposals uh, in April. Yes, April is the deadline for sending the, the proposal. You, show, you showed a different launch vehicle. It's uh, yeah. a, um, uh, using the aerodynamics to take off. The, yes. Uh, um, that uh, uh, wing profile. Mark 2 X or Yeah, I was looking for it. This one here, the website. Sixty-five percent less. Yes, let's buy one. This one. Mm -hmm. They are selling the, the tickets to. For hundred k, you can go. To <laughs> <laughs> you can book it online. Quick, start a Kickstarter, guys. <laughs> oh. So is this how, how far to development is this? Is this actually something they're going to be setting up this year? Sorry, I missed the date on this craft. Well. I'm not sure, but uh, the, they are going to give the money. So is this very no. early stages for this craft? Or? No, no, the craft is, is done. It's, it, uh, it's there. It's flying. It's supposed to, to fly in December, I think. I saw it somewhere. Uh, the call is just for the experiment. 
it's a Brazilian call, but the flight is, it's, uh, we saw it. It's yes. Dutch. Dutch, yes. Yeah, it's Dutch. Registered in the Netherlands. In the Netherlands, the company. I wouldn't go for this flight. Yeah, 100k, put it on the credit card. <laughs> <laughs> Cheryl, if you see 100k on the credit card, you know. <laughs> It's only five or six minutes though. Oh, um, is That looks like it's just got um, traditional rocket star propulsion. Does it have any atmosphere based propulsion for any period of the trip? I haven't. I think we'll have to have the stuff from the website. Alright, so we still have more rings and more nibbles so we can carry on discussing later on as well. So let's thank. Okay.